Do you need to know how to do a malnutrition assessment in the hospital? If so, then I've got a case study for you. My name is Mitchell Zandis, and this is CNU. Grace Peters is an 83-year-old female with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and asthma. She presented to the emergency room one day ago, complaining of abdominal pain, loss of appetite, and recent unintentional weight loss. A CT scan showed a pancreatic mass, and now she is admitted under internal medicine for further evaluation of suspected cancer. You're the registered dietitian, and you've been consulted by the primary medical team to assess the patient for malnutrition. You get right to work, keeping in mind that you may need to use the Academy Aspen Malnutrition Assessment Tool as part of your full nutrition assessment. Before you even lay eyes on the patient, you spend time in the electronic medical record learning as much as you can about her. You find that Miss Peters is 5 foot 2 with a current body weight of 145 pounds, leaving her with a body mass index of 26.5. You also find that she's been coming to your hospital system for the past 5 years, and because of this, her recent weight history is available to you. In 2016, her body weight was 182 pounds. Then she remained relatively stable all the way up until 5 months ago when she was 179 pounds. You'll want to get her perspective of her recent changes in body weight, but you can also go ahead and calculate the percent body weight lost using the objective data that you already have. I find that when there are multiple data points available, and there's no reason to suspect weight changes due to fluid shifts, then the information in the medical chart tends to be more reliable than the subjective data that the patient can provide. Most adults don't track their weight closely, and can either drastically overestimate or underestimate how much weight they have lost or gained. To obtain the percent body weight lost, you set up a simple equation. Percent weight loss equals the previous body weight minus the current body weight divided by the previous body weight times 100. So, we take 179 pounds from 5 months ago and minus the current weight of 145. Then we divide that by 179 pounds to get 0.19. Finally, we multiply 0.19 by 100, and the final result is 19%. The patient has an unintentional weight loss of 19% body weight in the past 6 months. Other information you'll want to look at prior to the interview include the medication list, laboratory values, the active diet order, and the documentation of how much the patient has been eating while hospitalized, if it's available to you. You'll also want to go through the recent notes from members of the interdisciplinary team, like nurses, doctors, social workers, and speech-language pathologists. Once you have gathered all the information you need, you head out to interview the patient. This is the part that scares a lot of dietetic interns and new dietitians. So what I want to know is, does the thought of interviewing patients scare you? Let me know in the comments section. During the interview, you learn that up until two months ago, Miss Peters was living normally. She was fully independent in all aspects of her life, including shopping for food and preparing meals. She had an excellent appetite and intake, eating three meals and one snack per day that consisted of foods from all of the major food groups. She was also quite active, walking one to two miles per day in her neighborhood, and didn't have any gastrointestinal issues like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. Today, all of that has changed. She tries to force herself to eat a small breakfast so she can take her medications, but is only able to eat a banana. Then she goes most of the day without feeling hungry. 
She drinks herbal tea with a blueberry muffin in the late afternoon, and that's usually it until she goes to bed around 9 p.m. This has been her routine on most days for the past six weeks. In addition to this, she feels extreme fatigue from walking, her clothes are feeling looser than they normally do, and she's been dealing with persistent abdominal pain, bloating, and constipation for the past 10 days. So far, she's only been able to eat 10-20% to of the meals that have been sent to her since she's been in the hospital. Visually, the patient doesn't match the classic textbook picture of malnutrition that's defined by extreme thinness and frailty. Remember, the patient has a BMI of 26.5, so technically she would be classified as overweight. But malnutrition can occur at any body size, and keeping the Academy Aspen tool in the back of your mind, you know that BMI is not one of the clinical characteristics. You go ahead and perform a nutrition-focused physical exam and observe muscle depletion to the temporalis. You also notice that both of her eyes appear sunken, suggesting subcutaneous fat loss of the orbitals. Next, you work your way down to the shoulders and clavicle and notice that they are more prominent than expected based on the patient's frame and amount of subcutaneous body fat. Interviewing the patient provided two key data points for the assessment of malnutrition. Before we see them, I just want to make sure you hit the like button on this video and are subscribed to the channel. The first key data point was the patient's report of usual intake. Before she was sick, she would eat three meals and one snack per day with foods from all food groups. But on most days in the past six weeks, she only consumes one banana and a blueberry muffin. With this information alone, we can safely estimate that her energy intake is less than 75% of her estimated energy need for greater than one month. If the inadequate energy intake wasn't so obvious, other strategies that could have been used include a more detailed account of the patient's usual intake with specific food selections and portion sizes, or we could conduct a formal calorie count of the meals served in the hospital for the next three to five days. The second key data point came from the physical assessment. This is where you saw subcutaneous fat loss to the orbitals and muscle loss to the temporalis, shoulders, and clavicle. Remember, one of the limitations of the Academy Aspen tool is that it relies on a subjective interpretation of what is mild, moderate, and severe fat and muscle loss. In other words, the dietitian needs to rely on their own clinical judgment to determine what it is that they observed. Being able to do this with confidence comes after performing dozens, if not hundreds of interviews and physical exams, so don't worry if you feel unsure about it. If you're not confident that muscle depletion or fat loss was observed, then you don't have to use it to diagnose malnutrition. With the Academy Aspen tool, the patient only needs to satisfy the criteria for two characteristics. In the case of Ms. Peters, we know for sure that there's been unintentional weight loss and inadequate energy intake. When it comes to applying the information gathered to the malnutrition assessment tool, the first step is to determine the etiology. Even though this patient hasn't been formally diagnosed with cancer, the time frame and story behind the patient's path to the hospital aligns with an etiology of chronic disease far better than it does with the other options. So, you would look to the parameters that have been established for moderate and severe malnutrition in the context of chronic disease for each characteristic. You found an energy intake of less than 75% of the estimated energy need for about 6 weeks, which satisfies the criteria for severe malnutrition. You found an unintentional weight loss of 19% body weight in 6 months, which also satisfies the criteria for severe malnutrition. 
At this point, whether you decide if it was mild or severe muscle depletion won't affect the diagnosis since the patient already satisfied two criteria in the severe category. Last but not least, you didn't observe any fluid accumulation or reduced grip strength. Just for the record, to include reduced grip strength, you must obtain a measurement using a hand grip dynamometer. It should never be a subjective measurement. I'll also point out that I think I found a mistake in the consensus statement from the Academy and Aspen. They put less than or equal to in front of severe malnutrition, but just less than in front of moderate malnutrition. This means that a patient who falls under severe could be eating better than a patient under moderate, and clearly that shouldn't be the case. Maybe we should email them to let them know. Given all the information gathered in the assessment, the patient meets the criteria for severe malnutrition in the setting of chronic disease. This is supported by a significant unintentional weight loss of greater than 10% body weight in 6 months and an estimated energy intake of less than 75% of the energy demand for greater than 1 month. Notice how the etiology, the severity, and the specific criteria that were met are included in the diagnosis. The diagnosis will then need to be endorsed by the medical doctor who is caring for the patient so it can be properly coded and submitted for reimbursement. The next video is going to be about the GLIM criteria, which you need to know about if you want to master malnutrition assessment. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, and let me know what you think about the case study format down in the comments.